Hi, this is Dr. Les, and welcome back to I Bought a Farm, So Now What? In the next two episodes, Dr. Jeff Limcooler will be joining me to discuss the forage management plan, including a rotational grazing discussion for these heifers. Hi, this is Dr. Les, and welcome back to another episode of I Bought a Farm. Now what? Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Limcooler. Dr. Lim Cooler is a beef extension specialist at the University of Kentucky and his specialty is beef cattle nutrition. But honestly, Jeff is kind of a jack of all trades, just to be honest about it. Uh, he is an expert in understanding forage systems. He's phenomenal with all areas of beef cattle nutrition, but he specializes a lot in uh, stalker cattle, uh, which is one of the enterprises that we considered was buying steers or heifers putting them on grass, raising them, and then selling them at a heavier weight. Uh, and Jeff, we've decided, we, we had a previous episode with Dr. Burdine, where we decided that probably in today's situation that we have, we have a lot more flexibility if we purchase in some heifers, particularly some five to maybe 550 weight heifers, bring those in, uh, put them on grass, and let them grow and develop, and then we'll reinvestigate you know, our profit potential in the fall. Um, and if we want to go ahead and put a little bit more money into them, and if the, if the market looks great and the profit margins look pretty good, then we'll probably sell them. But if we're not really where we're, where we're at our, our, our target as far as profit goes, then we will continue to develop them uh, and probably go ahead and, and breed them and then sell them as, as, as bread replacements later on hoping to capture the most added value that we could possibly capture out of those females, out of this enterprise. And so I know you've, you've seen some of the videos and you and I've talked about this pretty extensively, but just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with the situation, we had a landowner that came uh, to extension and wanted some ideas on how to capture some income out of this property that he owned. It's a very undeveloped farm. There were no cattle handling facilities. Uh, we had pretty good e exterior fence, one water, a tobacco barn, and two little pieces of property. We had a 31 acres on a hill farm, a literal hill farm, where at the top of the hill we had what looked like uh, an old tobacco patch, and then it just kind of comes down to the road. Um, and then about a mile away, we have about a five acre a patch that's actually uh, pretty pretty solid grass. We're ready to buy heifers. We're ready to start figuring out where uh, where we're going to get our heifers from, type, and all that stuff. But before I talk to the buyers, before I talk to the sale barn, before I talk to any any of our our private uh, treaty uh, opportunities, we got to figure out how many we're going to buy. Right? I mean. You got kind of got to start there. And so with starting there, we got to have a really good understanding of what our property can do as far as growing grass and how we can set up a forage management plan to maximize uh, our stocking rate and our opportunity for profit. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to turn this over to you and teach us everything you know about forage. Well, Dr. Anderson, thanks for the opportunity to join you on this. And uh, if it's everything I know, this will be a short session. Oh, but, everybody's uh, looking forward to that. <laughs> but uh, I think you brought up some very good points. And uh, this is a common question. Uh, we have a lot of folks that um, maybe are retiring from a career and coming back to the farm or uh, perhaps they they inherited a farm, whatever the case may be. But I just did this about uh, two weeks ago uh, in another part of the state. So uh, we get this question quite often, believe it or not. So I think what I'm going to try and do um, is share some screens and we're going to walk through some things here. Uh, real basic, you know, I think it's important that we start there. And um, one of the things that I'd like to um, uh, do is uh, kind of go through the, the fencing law. Um, so I thought what we would do is we would start with, um, you know, some of the real basics on, on legal fencing. And so what I've done is I've gone to um, 
the Kentucky General Assembly website page and uh, everyone should be able to see now um, KRS chapter 256, which is our fencing um, definitions and, and laws. And then you just need to familiarize yourself with these to protect yourself and protect your investment. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in any detail, but um, I would certainly be thinking about uh, having you read through this. If you don't understand this, uh, visit with a, a lawyer. We've got some great ag lawyers in this state and um, they can share this information uh, with great details. One of the first things that you should be able to see under definition is the definition of a lawful fence. And as we look at the definition of a lawful fence here, I'm going to pull this up and make it a little bigger so it might be easier to see on the screen. But the first part is a strong and sound fence, four feet high, so that cattle cannot creep through. It can be made of various materials, whether it be rails, wooden planks, uh, wire of any fashion. It could be barbed wire, it could be high tensile wire, it could be woven wire, etc. cetera. Uh, if we're thinking about um, uh, gates as well, you can go down and see, see that the gates need to be at least four feet high. And, and Dr. Les, I think you and I have seen plenty of single strand electric barbed wire fence as a perimeter fence. And what happens when that charger goes out and your cattle get out on the, the road and there's an accident? Yeah, you know, who's certain, liable? Who is liable? And this gives you a very clear explanation that the farmer in this case would be liable because that would not be essentially the definition of a legal fence. So we, we now can go through that and, and I'm not gonna get into great detail, but, but realize this is, um, Kentucky Statute 256-010 that gives you that definition. Now, I think that um, one of the other great tools that we have available to us is the Web Soil Survey. And hopefully now you can see um, the Web Soil Survey of this, uh, or the location on this farm. And yep, that's, see that? that's the 31 acre uh, parcel. Um, that is correct. Yep. Yes, yeah, so I think we're gonna start with the 31 acre parcel. Um, what I was able to do here is um, uh, plug that in. This is a tool that gives you an indication of the types of soils and potentially um, the, the quote unquote slope and, and productivity, but I'm going to use it real quick here just to give you a, an idea. Uh, we've got a great extension publication uh, in extension that uh, is available uh, to folks to download to learn how to use this tool. But also, I remember Adam mentioned going in and talking with folks in the conservation district office uh, or, or visiting with NRCS, and they can develop a grazing plan for you as well. But we're just going to quickly outline this. I'm going to do a real rough job here, Dr. Les, to, just to give us an idea what this tool can do. And as, as far as I know, this is you know kind of the, um, the area that we're talking about. And um, as we go through, you know, we can see over here on the left-hand side under my area of, of interest that it is roughly 32 acres. Now, how cool was that over here that we were able to get a, a rough area? You can do this for various fields that you have and, and it'll calculate these pretty quickly for you. Now, one of the reasons I like to, to start here is because then we can go up to the soil map tab and we'll click on the soil map tab and it will generate for us a map of the different soils. But Dr. Les has gone through this many times with you telling you that this is a hill farm. And if we look at the soil types, we see that 21 of the 32 acres or two thirds of this ground is what is referred to as a Fairmont flaggy silty clay with six to 12% slope. That's a pretty decent slope. That's a hill so, farm. Yes. And 
you know, without even being on the farm, I can see that this is a hill farm. So the other reason that we like to do this is some soils will promote great, greater growth or, or um, maybe more suitable for different types of forages. If we wanted to improve it with alfalfa, orchard grass, or something like this. So you can get an idea how suitable that might be. And we, we certainly aren't gonna wanna till up these 12% slopes and, and do something like that. Grow some really good rocks. <laughs> and we might wind up becoming a rock farm, but uh, find us a market for that, Dr. Anderson, and, and we'll be in good shape. You can also see here on this ridge top that you referred to that there's two different soil types up here that run through on this ridge top. And uh, they're McAfee silt loams, 6 to 12%. And then there's a, a little bit of uh, bluegrass Mari silt loam. And bluegrass Mari silt loam is known to be a very productive soil type, but unfortunately, it's less than 5% on this farm. So um, the other reason that I wanted you to see this is uh, you can understand just by looking at the soil maps why this area may have been a uh, tobacco patch, being that yeah. it's a silt loam. Uh, doesn't have that clay structure. It's a bit more suitable to, to grow crops. It's going to drain a little bit better. And tobacco doesn't like, um, you know, to have really wet feet and you'll get uh, black shank and disease and some of those other issues with it. So anyways, there's, a, this, there's an opportunity ahead. for us there in that little area to actually grow something if we decide to at some point. Absolutely correct, and that, that would be an area to think about um, if you wanted to do renovations, that's where we would start. Now this map looks a little different than the one we'll use on Google Earth. Uh, this is a little bit more updated map. and uh, you can, you'll, you'll see these features change um, as we move through this map to the other. So uh, NRCS just updated this March of this year, so the maps are a little bit more updated and maybe show a more current picture uh, from the satellite image. Now I know then from the majority of this that we've got this type of soil that should be relatively similar in productivity. That's our assumption. We know this is the ridge top or the hill and um, so if we want to place or begin thinking about placing divisions on the, the pasture, you know, we've got a few things to keep in mind. Where is the water going to come from? And we can see here that we've got a pond here. And I believe there's a water, uh, city water, a municipal water source up in this area somewhere close to the barn. The other component we want to think about is shade. Now, this is oriented north south. So we'll have morning shade as the sun's coming from east to west. You know, actually, it's going to come more like this. But east to west, we're going to have shade in the morning on kind of this side of the tree lines. And in the afternoon, we'll have shade on this side of the tree lines. But we just want to make sure that our divisions allow for shade in all the paddocks. And if we don't have shade in all those paddocks, we have to make sure that we can get them to shade when they may need it. And in July, August, if we have some extremely hot days. Uh, we may have to set up some temporary lanes or take some subdivisions down to give them access to some shade during those extremes. But uh, this is going to make it somewhat easy because we've got several trees and mature trees in here to give us shade. Okay, so now let's switch over to Dr. Anderson's Google Earth map. And this is that same pasture area that we were looking at. Uh, we've got the field outlined here, and one of the quickest and easiest divisions um, is simply to think about this field. Dr. Anderson, can you tell us a little bit, is, is this field fenced in completely? It, it, yes, it is. Uh, in the uh, northeast corner, there's a gate, and in the northwest corner, there's a, a gate, but otherwise it's completely fenced in. So this is beautiful um, because it, it A, takes advantage of that different soil type that we know is in there, and B, it's already fenced in. The challenge we have then with this is water. We've got trees for shade, but we have to think about how we're going to get water. And so 
naturally one option we have is, is going to be to come back down here to the pond. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this pond is already being utilized for water. Uh, yeah, I, you know, what's on the farm right now is four young bulls that their neighbor just asked them if they could throw, you know, so yeah, it's being used for water, um, but it's, there's no pressure on it at all. There's, you know, the bulls are just kind of in there to get them out of their neighbor's way. So what we can do is we could start up here at this northwest corner. Um, we could put in some type of a line. We would want to go to the farm itself and, and look at this a little bit better to, to find out exactly where we want to have a um, fence coming down here for our water source. But I'm just going to, for simplistic standpoint, uh, put in this fence and and uh, we're just going to have some names here and, and put these in so we've got them for later. We would ideally fence this pond out and have a controlled access or gravity flow into a tank below the dam and we'll probably develop that water source in the future. Um, so we, we won't spend a lot of time. Um, the landowner could go into the uh, conservation office and, and visit with them about what resources they could get to cost share to fence out that pond and develop a water system. I would encourage them to do that, but right now we're, we're operating under the assumptions that there's limited cash flow and we're going to try and minimize the investments uh, at this point and use that money to buy the cattle and those improvements can come at a later date. Now, the other thing that we can think about is there appears at one point in time maybe to be a dry creek or a, a creek that runs temporarily out of this pond um, through here. And this would be a natural area to kind of come in and, and divide this if this is um, what I think it is here on the top. So we're gonna just real quickly think about dragging and, and, and putting in a fence line down along this way. I'm thinking about dividing this up somewhat into another area. And, and I'm just gonna call this the ditch fence. It may not be that but that's what we're gonna call it for right now. So once we have those two, what we basically have done already, uh, Dr. Anderson, is we've got one field, two fields, three fields. And ideally what I'd like to see is, is four divisions. If, if we could get four divisions and, and somewhat of equal size and equal productivity that we could be in a situation where maybe we only have to move cattle once a week. And that fits a lot of folks that have off the farm employment. They can go out on a weekend and move cattle, check fences, move temporary reels, fences if they need to. But that's kind of the mindset is, is move once a week. And if we did that, then we would have somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 20 days of rest, 21 days of rest before we get back in on some of these fields. That's the key part about a managed grazing system is providing ample time for that forage to regrow. And that rest is gonna allow us to get greater productivity. With that management over time, it's gonna improve the, the root system. We're gonna get more even manure distribution of the nutrients back across the field and, and improve that. So let's, put in one more division to get us a fourth kind of uh, field in here. Now the challenge that I think that we're gonna have, we're gonna wanna run the contour the best that we can on this hillside, and then also have an access point down here for the pond as a water source. And so we'll adjust this later on, but for the time being, what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna kind of run along the contour here and, and get roughly an equal size. Now, you, you might say that, well, Jeff, that doesn't look like it's very equal. This upper half looks a little bit bigger than this bottom half. But one thing that we know about hill farms is with erosion, your soil, topsoil is gonna move down the hillside. So there's gonna be 
more topsoil typically down in this area that means greater soil holding or moisture holding capacity those deeper soils going to be a little bit more productive because these are probably going to have some erosion a little bit shallower so the field needs to be a little bit bigger to account for that reduced productivity when we move into July and August when soil moisture becomes an issue. Yeah, I've been all over the farm and you're 100% right on that. The section that you just, uh, you know, there right in the smack middle of the farm in the middle of the hill, pretty thin, man, pretty thin. And that's typical for, for this southern uh, Woodford County area. You can see rock outcroppings and oh, yeah. Um, that, yeah. So that's the other component about thinking about laying out these farms is um, don't do this just on an aerial map. Use the aerial map like we're doing to start with and then get out boots on the ground, right? And, yeah. and look at this farm. So the other things that we'll do is um, you, can, you can think about this farm now as having these multiple areas. We've got shade. It appears that we've got decent shade in all areas. Um, we're also going to eventually, either with temporary or semi-temporary fence, um, we're going to put a lane fence down here to the water source. And that lane fence is simply going to allow us to be able to get these cattle from this field here on the hilltop down into our water source. A, a guiding principle when we think about water sources for cattle is we would like to have water within about 800 feet of the furthest reach of the pasture, but it doesn't always work. Um, cattle will travel up to a mile to get water if they need to. It's um, not what we would prefer because what's going to happen in this situation, cattle are going to move in this lane. They're going to want to spend time down here cooling off in the pond, getting water in the pond. And then they're going to come up here and they're going to hang out in the shade. And afternoon shade is going to, you know, kind of be in this area. They're going to spend a lot of time here. This back part of the field is going to wind up being less grazed or undergrazed. And this upper part, this north part of the field is gonna get overgrazed because they're gonna be constantly going back and forth here. But, but these are the real world situation. And with some cost share money in the future, we might be able to put a pump in here to a holding tank and then gravity flow water down to the middle of the field or something like that in the future. But for right now, this is what we've got to work with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the way we're gonna, or I would propose to, to lay this out. Now, another thing with Google Earth is, is we can measure this field and, and hopefully um, you can see this. I'm gonna to kind of go from this point and just move straight down to this point. And we can see that it's 300 meters. Um, I can change that here into feet, and we can see that that's almost a thousand feet from the pond down to kind of that edge. And that's plus or minus 50 feet, right, Dr. Anderson? So, yeah, exactly. It gets us that idea. We say, you know, kind of keep them within that six, 800 feet range. Um, you know, we're, we're at a thousand, so it's not horrible. Um, but it's further than we like, and we know then that we're, we're gonna wind up having some issues. If you wanted to do that and, and check it again from, say, from this point, um, you can get back here to the far reaches and, and see that we're you know, gonna be close to 900 to 1,000 feet by the time they get back there, because yeah. they're gonna have to walk the lane and come back down. So, so just one thing to help us, maybe if we put uh, the mineral feeder way down here on the, the south east corner of that of that top field of the you know uh, of the tobacco patch put it you know could go over here on the southeast corner and so make them that'll make them come up and utilize that area a little bit more to go get their mineral exactly so anywhere in the southern half 
you know, the, that would be ideal. You could have it anywhere down in here, you know. Sometimes we have to be a little careful to keep our mineral feeders not so close to shade because they'll have overconsumption. Yeah, they're like they're like me. If it's easy for me to get food, I'm gonna eat it. If it's more challenging, then then I'll think twice about doing it. So anywhere in the southern half, having that mineral feeder down here would be great to try and encourage them to move down that way. And and that same concept, Dr. Les, as we move into this field and this field, we should try and keep that, you know, further away from the water source to get them to move. Yep. So that's that's it in a nutshell on basically breaking this field into four pieces um, with poly wire and temporary tread in post then what we can do is is real quickly we can come in and begin some some neat subdivisions and, and split this field up a little bit further if we wanted to um, we could Think about running another temporary fence along this way if we wanted to. However, we decided to do that, and those fences can be pulled up and moved really quickly. Um, Resource-wise, as if it were me and, and and thinking about this, temporary materials. Temporary Absolutely. meaning a, a single strand of high tensile fence and some. Um, small rebar type posts or T-posts. It could be plastic tread in posts with a single strand of aluminum wire. I, I like to use aluminum on situations like this or um, the pliable high tensile wire because I can string it up really quick and I can take it down really quick. The high tensile wire and the aluminum wire will carry a little bit more current with less resistance than what a poly wire or a plastic braided um, wire will. So we're going to use a combination of both, I think, on this farm. We're going to set up a little bit of aluminum fence, and it's going to be our, what I would say, uh, we, we've heard people talk about our extension cord. We'll set up a, a solar charger on this farm somewhere, and then we'll use aluminum fence maybe down this away to be an extension cord that then we can use temporary reels to come and subdivide this even further and make multiple paddocks if we needed. And we would start here and, and put a temporary fence in, for example, in, in this field. And they would be able to back graze. Go call that temp. They would be able to, to graze this, come on in here to get water. And then what we could do is we could take this fence down, put another one up across this section, and then the cattle would back graze that first area, but because there's new forage, they're gonna wanna move into here and spend more time in this area. And that'll help can, utilize that forage on that south side. Exactly, exactly. And now what we're doing is we're increasing the number of paddocks given areas um, opportunities to get more even manure distribution and nutrients back in these areas as well. So that's uh, kind of the approach if you if you think about it from that standpoint on this farm. Um, the, the area up here by the barn will be a great area with some reels and temporary fence if we needed to but I think did you say there was fence already in this area? Yeah, that, that whole barn lot is fenced off. I mean, you can almost see that deeper green is fenced off. And it's really good poly, or poly wire fence. I mean, it's good fence. Yeah, so, so we've got good fence in, in this area. And what is the beauty about this? This is gonna be our receiving area. We've got an, an opportunity to, to use this acreage to get cattle out on pasture, um, but yet keep them up close to uh, the barn where we can put our temporary working facility in and uh, keep an eye on these calves. And if we need to be able to get them up to treat them for respiratory disease or anything like that, they're going to be close for the first few days. And, and certainly less stress on a, a farmer that hasn't worked a lot of cattle and, and 
uh, the cattle from moving them way back here in this back field all the way up to where the working facility might be. So we're going to do some additional um, footage, I think, on this and maybe an upcoming episode, or I can go out and get some other footage when we start putting these fence lines in. We'll look at the energizer or charger. We're going to use solar chargers. You've got three choices, a plug-in, a battery that uses kind of a, um, a, a deep marine 12 volt type battery for boats or a combination that uh, uses a solar charger panel to charge a battery uh, that would energize the fence. And uh, the, the plug-ins are gonna give you more power uh, for the cost. As you move from plug-ins to solar, the cost per uh, unit of power that you get tends to get more expensive. But in this situation, we're gonna use some, some solar fencers that we have on hand. And again, if the landowner decides that he doesn't want to pursue this any longer, everything will be able to be pulled up in probably a half a day. So it'll take us a half a day to lay it out and a half a day to pull it up. This is the mindset for folks too that they should think about on rented ground. If you've got a short term lease, um, it does not make sense to invest a lot of money in fencing material if you're gonna be kicked off in a year. If you've got a 10 year lease, then you can think about sinking some money into infrastructure. Dr. Sounds, Anderson? Sounds I perfect. I, uh, sounds perfect. Uh, you know, we're thinking about receiving the cattle uh, maybe toward the end of this week or beginning of next week, and we'll just receive them up in the barn lot. Um, and leave them up there for, you know, probably a week, just to be honest about it. Um, after that, I assume we're gonna turn out on that uh, northern section and let them graze through that um, and then rotate them clockwise uh, through and, um, and then come back in about a month and be back on that, back on that northern section. Does that sound about right? That sounds exactly right. Perfect. Anything else? No, sir. Phenomenal. Thanks a ton, Jeff, for uh, joining us today and uh, giving us a phenomenal, just a phenomenal um, session on forage management. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. And we'll see you next time on I Bought a Farm. Now what?